Very excited today on Off the Podium to return to the sport of Rugby Sevens. We actually haven't had an athlete from the sport uh, in, in a couple of years. And today, we're not only speaking to our first athlete from Rugby Sevens in a while, our first ever Canadian athlete from the sport of Rugby Sevens. He competed as part of the Tokyo Olympic Team, Team Canada, also competed at the Commonwealth Games, and also in the Rugby World Cup in 2019. And I'm very excited to learn a little bit more about his journey in the sport, the sport in Canada, and everything else in between. It's a pleasure to welcome to Off the Podium, Mr. Andrew Coe. Andrew, first of all, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to speak with you today. Thanks for having me. It's awesome to speak with you as well. Obviously, you're, uh, you, you live in Victoria, so we can you know, chat a little bit about Victoria and what there is to offer over here. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm repping the Pacific FC jersey today. I was mentioning to you off there, I thought I'd go a little bit yeah. more local uh, sort of with that as well. I mean, you're, you're all based out in, in the same stadium, right? So kind of you're essentially right there. So, I, I'm, I mean, do you actually get to sort of, do you train or sort of, you know, bump into the Pacific FC guys or is we, it kind of all, you know, not really around the same area? It, no, it's, it's all, I mean, it's all under the same facility. We train on the same field. We bump into them. You know, now and again, um, you know, we're quite friendly with them. Um, so we see them all the time, but I actually haven't been to one of the games yet. So I think that's up on uh, what's next for me to go to in Victoria is I need to go to PFC game because it looks like a ton of fun. And, you know, we train at the same facility, so I got to go support them. Yeah, exactly. Out in uh, Langford, beautiful part Langford. of uh, Victoria. I mean, you're close to Costco as well. So I can imagine that it's freaking, uh, <laughs> exactly. Free. That's yeah. that's the main thing, right? You're close to Costco, so that's that's good exactly. parts of the the city. <laughs> yeah, you go to Costco, get a hot dog and all your groceries, and you're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's on the training regiment. You know, go get your yeah. dollar hot dog from Costco, essentially. Uh, while Hopefully, you're there. my coach doesn't hear about that. But uh, <laughs> it's okay. That's where you're going all those times when we thought you were. <laughs> Training, basically that's why yeah. you, you've always got ketchup on your face basically when you when you're coming <laughs> back but I, I believe you i mean while we're on the topic of soccer I, I believe you sort of switched to rugby from soccer you actually grew up playing soccer if, if that's correct i mean how do you go from playing soccer to playing rugby because besides the use of a ball and a similar field i don't really see too much of a connection between the sports yeah um it's all about my dad. My dad was the one who made that call. Uh, I was playing soccer growing up and I love playing soccer, but I was uh, quite a big kid. And um, I kept getting, you know, they were just teaching us how to shoulder check in soccer. And I kept getting yellow cards, red cards. I kept getting kicked out of soccer games. And my dad eventually had enough because he didn't want me just to get kicked out of all these soccer games that he's paying for me to go to. And he was playing rugby at the time, joined uh, the, the Markham club. Um, so he brought me out and we kind of did a little tester. I went to a couple of sessions and I, I loved running around out there with the ball. And, uh, you know, I haven't looked back since. I'm always fascinated learning about the sport in Canada because obviously coming from Australia where rugby is a very big deal, um, it's always interesting when, say, we look at a country like Canada and think, well, they're not one of these, I guess, superpowers in rugby, so how do people get involved? But one thing I found when I lived in Canada was that the sport is actually quite big. It's 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 very well uh, you know, supported, very well attended, and particularly, obviously, on the West Coast. But this was in Ontario, if I'm not correct. So what's kind of the rugby, the rugby scene like sort of growing up in that part of the country where maybe the winters are a little bit colder uh, and sort of it's yeah. not quite how it is over on, on the West Coast where you are at the moment. Yeah, almost exclusively everyone plays in high school. You know, that's when, you know, that's the most common story. People start playing in high school um, and then, yeah, they, they, they grow up playing hockey and, and soccer and basketball. Um, and then the younger age groups of, of rugby isn't really delivered too much to, to, to younger athletes. Um, so everyone starts playing in high school. And then, you know, if they keep playing throughout university and, and there's a lot of strong clubs out in Ontario as well. But the weather is tricky. You know, we get down to minus 10, minus 20 in the, in the winters. So there's no rugby going on. So everything has to be condensed within, you know, you're looking at May to May to October and all of the rugby that's being done is done between May and October. Unlike out here on the West coast when you can play pretty much year round. Mm. So it's, it's, it's a bit difficult for, for people over in rugby Ontario to, to navigate that, but they do a great job, um, you know, getting people involved and, and engaged in the sport. Outside of soccer and then and rugby, were you involved in any other 
sports sort of growing up? And then did you all of a sudden just go, okay, I've got to focus on my rugby now because this is taking me places? Oh, I played, I played everything growing up. Hockey, soccer, lacrosse, basketball. Um, tried out for a couple of volleyball teams, but I wasn't good enough to make it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, I just love playing sports and, and the camaraderie. And that's, that's what really separated rugby from all the other sports is, you know, all of my best friends and the com- camaraderie that rugby provided me was just too much fun to give up. Um, and then eventually it got to a point where I could see myself playing it competitively. And that's when all the looks for universities and, and age grade national team programs came up and, um, yeah, it's, it's been fun. In that period when you're playing, is it, is it mainly just 15s? I mean, was sevens much of a thing sort of during those initial years when you started playing? Yeah, it's mostly 15s. Um, there were a couple sevens tournaments growing up, but for the majority, it's just 15s, um, both at a, a club level, um, high school level, university level. It's 15s is the priority. And then, you know, there's a couple off sevens tournaments here and there. Which, because of that period, of course, sevens wasn't an Olympic sport. I mean, it was right on the cusp. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, when you're setting yourself career goals it's not like as a as a rugby player as a teenager at that point you can say i want to play in the olympics right i mean i'm guessing is the goal at that point to make the national squad to make a world cup pretty much yeah the the goal is to make a a 15s world cup because that's pre-olympics and that was also pre-mlr so you Mm -hmm. didn't have a, a professional setup in in canada that players can strive towards so it's there's some pretty big jumps back when I was growing up you know you go from high school into university um, and then you go straight from club level rugby to the national team and in a world cup and playing against the all blacks like the best in the world and you you're playing you know James Bay or, or UBC on on the weekend and then you go and play these top teams so it wasn't until um you know, thankfully the Olympics, they let sevens come into the Olympics and the MLR now that guys can look at those types of goals, which are steps to, you know, a World Cup or an Olympics. Do, do you remember when it was announced that sevens was going to be an Olympic sport? And, and was what was that moment like? I mean, had, was that like, wow, great thing to achieve for? I mean, had you sort of grown up watching the Olympics thinking this would be cool and now you can potentially achieve this goal of becoming an Olympian? Yeah, I think everyone wants to to be an Olympian, at least, you know, most kids playing sports want to be Olympians growing up because, you know, if it's not hockey over here, it's some sort of sporting event. Swimming's massive during Summer Olympics. Um, and I, I had that goal too, but I never really had that outlet because I didn't play any sports that were in, or I wasn't high enough level to play in sports in the Olympics. Uh, then they let rugby in, and as soon as they let rugby in, it, it kind of flipped a switch for me that said, okay, you can really do this. You can, if you put your, your mind to it, you can become an Olympian, and, and you can represent your country on the, the biggest stage of sport. And, and right from when they let that, uh, the trial run go in, in Rio, um, you know, it's something that I always wanted to do. And does that change sort of the mindset? I mean, do you still then have, the goal of a world cup. Cause I mean, I, I guess the, the, the unique thing about rugby is that 15s and sevens, you know, they're vastly different, but at the same time, very, very similar and that you can achieve and you ultimately, and we'll talk about achieve both goals, but does the Olympics become more important than, than achieving the world cup or do you weight them equally? You know, I get that question asked a lot, <laughs> you know, 15s or sevens, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's a tough answer. Because, um, you know, the Olympics is the pinnacle of sport in any, any sporting event, right? The Olympics is the pinnacle. Um, so if I had to choose going to the Olympics, it, I feel like it really meant more to me than going to a Rugby World Cup. But that being said, going to a Rugby World Cup is an unbelievable experience as well. And, um, you know, I do not take that for granted. Um, 
But yeah, I think you're the first person I've admitted to uh, sevens. The Olympics is better than the World Cup. So exclusive. We like it. We like getting exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it yeah. is that real uniqueness about it because I think what sevens has done though is it's really grown the sport and made it more accessible to a lot of these countries. Going back to my point about sort of the lesser traditional nations that you sort of think about, because again canada doing so well you've got all these other nations i mean look at fiji for example and kind of the us and all these countries that not necessarily traditional powerhouses in rugby can go to a, a sevens tournament and, and win a medal win it by any chance whereas realistically canada are probably not going to finish top four maybe not even top eight at a rugby world cup are they so it kind of it does open that competitive nature to grow the sport which maybe who knows could expand the 15s game in 10 20 30 years time yeah the, uh, both the sevens and the 15s are yes they're different but it's still rugby at the end of the day and the skills are very much interchangeable um and yeah sevens has done an unbelievable job especially here in canada with the Olympics, with us winning um, Singapore back in 2017, I believe it was. Um, and uh, we, we host a Vancouver Sevens tournament that, you know, is one of the favorite weekends of the year here in Vancouver because so many fans get to go out and enjoy and watch Sevens live. And that does wonders for growing the sport and we get to win a lot of the games, you know, I think across any, any sport being a fan, you want your team to win. And uh, unfortunately with, with 15s in the way it is us going up against New Zealand and South Africa in, in a world cup is, you know, we're probably not going to win those games. So it's more fun for a fan to cheer if you have a shot at winning than, than not. But on the flip side of that though, getting to play the All Blacks in a World Cup. I mean, that that's like making the NBA and you get to play against the Lakers and you're playing against LeBron. I mean, you know, you, you, you maybe realistically know you're not going to win, but you're on the biggest stage in your sport against the greatest team that exists in that sport. I mean, that's a pretty special feeling. It was, it was hard. I was being starstruck. Mid-game, <laughs> you know, I remember playing South Africa and I made a tackle on Sia Khaleesi and I remember getting up, I was like, Oh my God, I just made a tackle on Sia Khaleesi. <laughs> I, was, I was so starstruck the whole time. And just to play against that level of competition and see like, this is what it takes. This is what the best team in the world do to, to be the best. It was very humbling because <laughs> obviously the scoreline reflected that. Um, but, it, but it's an experience that I'm going to remember for a long time. I ended up trading a jersey... Um, with Ben Smith for an all black Sproul cup Jersey. Nice. Um, but I didn't get my hands on a South Africa world cup Jersey. So wow. well, there's still time for regret. Yeah. Know, yeah. Sort of, you've got other ones, but I've always wanted to know what is it like standing in front of the all blacks as they're doing the hucker at a world cup? I mean, is it as intimidating as it looks? Um, I wouldn't say intimidate. It's, it, it's, yeah, it goes back to just me being starstruck, you know, <laughs> it's funny cause it's such a pinnacle and such a massive thing in rugby. Um, so we're, we're all lined up watching them do the Hawka, but then there's also, you know, everyone knows the word. So there's a stadium of 60,000 people doing the Hawka with them. Um, and it's, it's, you know, I kind of took it more of, uh, you know, enjoy the moment and en enjoy what's happening because I was never going to get it again instead of an intimidation tactic. Which, because I think that's a unique aspect. I always love kind of when they cut to the opposing team and you're all sort of linked arms and you've got that sort of look on your face like, fuck you, we're not going to let you intimidate us. But at the same time, you're going, oh my God, it's the hucker. It's right in front of us. This is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially because, you know, we we don't see that every day. You know, mm. the likes of, you know, the teams that play in New Zealand all the time, you know, they're used to seeing the Hawka, but this is like once every four years potentially that, that we get to face off against them. So it's it's quite, uh, quite surreal. And there's definitely uh, – I've got a video of it somewhere 
So I'm gonna gonna cherish that video. Which it's actually interesting. I lived in New Zealand for a bit, and I didn't personally realize that it wasn't just a sporting thing. Like they actually do this. Like I, I worked as a journalist, and you would go to the opening of a school or some sort of school event, and the kids would perform a haka. I went to a a, a funeral of a prominent rugby player, and they perform sort of a send off haka as the the co- like. It's it's actually really incredible to kind of see yeah. how traditional that is to New Zealand, and sort of you see that obviously. You know, a lot of the Pacific Islanders have sort of their own version. In Australia, we've started doing the sort of the welcome to country sort of thing now to kind of associate that. I mean, is there something that as Team Canada you can kind of do, like a traditional kind of something before a match or has it been talked about to kind of relate? Because this is a very rugby-based thing almost, isn't it? It it is, just because New Zealand's, you know, have been doing it for so long. Um, And and New Zealand as a country is unbelievable, unbelievable with how – you know, they've, they've worked on, you know, the, the traditional Aboriginal Maori people who were there um, interwoven with uh, society as a whole, because Canada, we struggle with that quite a bit. How do we, you know, get tra- our traditional Aboriginal people into society and how do we, you know, thank them and, and do all that kind of stuff. And, um, there's nothing, we haven't spoken about it, but I think we definitely need to do more in the Aboriginal community, um, just to link it with rugby because rugby is one of those sports where, um, you know, it's extremely diverse. It's very open. Um, and we want to see everyone just enjoy the sport. So I think we need to do a better job of getting, uh, rugby into the Aboriginal communities. It, it, it and is, thankfully it's... we've had phil mack who who is native and he has done a phenomenal job in in starting you know thunder rugby which is a a native based um rugby program and and a lot of you know it gets a lot more native kids playing rugby great yeah i mean it's 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 very again sort of in the eye-opening aspect living in new zealand of just that integration that sort of is just so natural exactly up there and it's sort of we're similar in australia kind of how it is in Canada, sort of with the, some of those issues as well. So it's, um, yeah, it's it's very fascinating to kind of see how they do that. Just on that topic too, when it comes to nicknames in Australia, we're a very big country for naming all of our teams, right? Uh, obviously, we have the Wallabies, New Zealand's the All yeah. Blacks, South Africa the Springboks. Does Team Canada have a nickname? Is there something that we can call you at a at a World Cup or a Rugby Sevens? And if not, can we can we create something? Because I feel you need to have something. Let's start. Let's start something. Let's start spitballing yeah. ideas. I feel like we can get something going. You know, a lot of Canadians. I feel like the most common one is Canuck. Yeah. You know, you get the Canucks. Um, but yeah, I'm open to anything. Our our team motto right now with the the sevens team entering into this new cycle is that we're we're the bad news bears. You know, bears are <laughs> Canadian. <laughs> Well, the Grizzlies, branding. right there. there the Grizzlies, go. there we go. Go yeah. for the Grizzlies straight away. I mean, I don't, I don't want to say the Canucks just because that just makes me think of a mediocre hockey team, but you could, you, you know, true. go. I mean, Vancouver Grizzlies used to be a thing and you're based sort of out west, so kind of, you know, it kind of all connects there in some weird way, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm into that. Let's 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 start rolling with that. Yeah, All Blacks versus the Grizzlies, the Wallabies versus the Grizzlies. I mean, straight away that sounds intimidating. Like if I'm picturing two animals in a in a cage fighting and I've got a Wallaby versus a Grizzly, that Wallaby stands no fucking chance. So, you know, straight oh, away yeah. you've got the advantage right there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's going to get its ass we kicked. Can get, you know, there, have you ever been up to uh, the top of Grouse Mountain? I have not. That was one place I didn't get to go to, sadly. Uh, well, they, they have a grizzly that lives on the top of Grouse Mountain that everyone goes wow. and sees. I'm thinking whenever we play a game, we can bring the grizzly down yes. and show him off on the field. Yeah, you don't need a haka. You just got a freaking grizzly bear. Like, yeah, New we got a grizzly going, beside us. Haka, and you're just like, okay, we see your haka. There's our bear. Stare it down, all right? <laughs> I like it. I like it. I'll pitch that to the, the big wigs up top and see if they, Good. they like it too. Good. I like that. That's how it works. In terms of um, positions, when sort of are you – do you play sort of same positions when it comes to 15s and 7s? Do you sort of alternate? I mean, kind of like how does that work for you? Um, honestly, I just go where people tell me to go. <laughs> <laughs> That's the I best feel way like to I do it. Like, yeah, exactly. Whatever gets me on the field, I'll you know I'll play in the front row if it gets me on the field. I don't think I'll do very well, but you know, I'll 
I'll give it the good old college try. Uh, but for the most part, I'm I'm a winger fullback in 15s, and I'm either a 10 center in in um, in sevens. So and is it a kind, preference? Like, is that just kind of where you? I mean, that's kind of where you've trained most of your time, or that's where you've been positioned, or is that you sort pretty of much? That's like? where you know where my skill set best aligns with the skill set skill set of uh, you know what's needed in that um, position. So I feel like that's that's best suited for me. In terms of your progression through the sport, when you first get that call up to represent Canada, I, I believe one of, if, if it wasn't your first game, one of your first games, you, you play against the Maori All Blacks, get man of the match in terms of that yeah. in, in the 15s. I mean, like what what's that experience like from going from the call up to, to playing a, a team like that? I mean, is that all of a sudden when you're thinking to yourself, like this, this is this is happening, those sort of dreams as I had as a young boy are kind of slowly coming into place? Yeah, it's yeah, it's there's a quote I heard where things happen gradually and then all of a sudden. And that's very much how I felt about my rugby career was it's very gradual and I'm taking the steps, I'm going to university, I'm you know, playing club rugby. And then all of a sudden I'm in a test match against the Maori All Blacks. And uh it's kind of surreal at the time. I was still very young. I was only twenty one when that happened. And um it was just very eye-opening to me, and I I felt very positive about that game because personally I did very well and got man of the match. But looking back, we didn't have a good game as a team, and uh, I think that's how my mindset has changed from being you know the young guy on the team, and you know it's all about how I perform and how I do. Into now I'm an older guy, and it's like this is way more of a team sport. You know, if I do well, it does. It doesn't really matter unless the team does well. Because it's one of those interesting aspects: uh, a man of the match award, no matter what sort of sport it is. That yeah, if you you sort of particularly if you're in the losing side, it's kind of it's one of those weird sort of things where you're like, well, well, how do I take this? Like, I'm sure personally, it's a great achievement, but at the same time, as you said, it's such a team based sport that ultimately it, it doesn't bring a difference to the scoreline at the end of the day. Yeah, exactly. It's it's. It was a tricky situation because we still lost like quite a bit of points. Um, and we had to go fly out to Georgia the next week and we played Georgia the following week in Georgia, which was uh, quite intimidating in and of itself. Um, so, it, yeah, especially being part of a, a losing side and gaining that sort of, um, you know, accolade. Uh, you know, you kind of take it with a grain of salt and it doesn't feel quite right in your mouth that, you know, it's, yes, it's nice to be rewarded for doing well, but at the end of the day, it's not what we wanted. We wanted to win. So I'm happy it happened, but, uh, you know, looking, looking forward, um, you know, it needs to be more of a team, get the whole team on board. It must be interesting. You mentioned going to Georgia. When I when I was in New Zealand, I did a story on the coach of the Georgian team because he was a Kiwi. He was from the area that I that I was from, and learning a lot about how much the sport is growing in Georgia and how it's nearly on par with, oh, with yeah. soccer in terms of how big it is there. Which, when you are playing a country like Georgia, which I guess in many levels is kind of similar to Canada and the global rugby side of things, right? It's sort of below the sort of the main group of countries. So are those games when you get those opportunities really important because this is where Canada can really show their worth against similar emerging nations that you are kind of competing with to try and be the next big, big thing in the sport. Absolutely. All those, all those sorts of games, Georgia, Romania, um, every time we play the U.S., it's a battle of, you know, the, who's the top North American team. Um, I feel like it's very important just on the Georgians. You need to kind of be given a cultural background on the team that you're playing. And I felt like we lacked that when we played them because, you know, Georgia is a very proud country and a proud team. Um, and there's a lot of guys who – you know, they're, they grew up in some tough situations compared to all of us Canadians who were very fortunate to grow up in, you know, a nice, nice ecosystem. Um, 
so it's very like we need to do a better job of, of learning about the cultures of the teams that we're playing, regardless of who it is. Um, so that if we can understand our team, the team we're playing, then we can, you know, try and make a game plan to fit taking them down so that we can still come on top of the win. Which also then takes you to a country like Georgia, which I can imagine that you never thought, like if somebody said to you, you're going to go to Georgia, you think, cool, I get to go to Atlanta, nice city, why not? But uh, not necessarily yeah. to Georgia and Europe, not, not really a number I, one travel destination for most Canadians. I, before going there, I could not point it out on a map. <laughs> so it was very, yeah. I just got on a flight and didn't really know where I was off to. <laughs> which does that make it then unique? Like, I don't, I'm not sure how much downtime you would get when you're going to an event like that, but like if all of a sudden you've got a couple of hours to spare and you're, you're around Tbilisi or wherever you are, just kind of checking out some local Georgian culture must make it even more unique. Absolutely. Rugby is such a global sport that it's not just Georgia, just taking me all over the world. And it's such an amazing place. And there's so many amazing people that you just want to dive into the culture and even going to Georgia, which isn't the top of my bucket list. I had an amazing time because the people there were quite nice. Um, you know, they want to share that culture with you and our liaison officers do a great job of, you know, taking us to good restaurants. This is traditional Georgian food and, and really showing us the works around, around the city. And it's, that's probably what I'll remember most about my career playing is all the amazing places that I've been to. One of those places right here in Australia, Gold Coast 2018 oh, yeah. for the, the Commonwealth Games. I mean, what was that experience like? And also, uh, too, I'm guessing that would have probably been your first taste of a multi-sport event because outside of an Olympics, I mean, rugby, what, Pan Ams and, and Commonwealth Games really, isn't it? So to kind of get that whole experience of not only being there for rugby, but you can experience everything that's going on around you with all the other sports too. Yeah, the Commonwealth is a warm-up to the Olympics. And I think I was one of two guys on the team who have never been to the multi-sport a multi-sport games before and it really <laughs> it humbles you quite a bit because you're with all these other amazing athletes and everyone is so focused on their own sort of experience and their own games and their own matches that they have to play um that it's it's unique to see and it's tough to get out of your head while you're there because you're so focused on your own performance but you really need to you know make the most out of your times there but gold coast was an amazing amazing place it did such a good job with um you know the transportation that we could do the village itself had you know had a barber in there they had everything you could ask for in there. There's a bar for when people finish, you go drinking at the bar. It was such an amazing experience. Um, it really makes me, you know, want to do all the games. I haven't been to a Pan Am game yet. I really want to go to another Olympics. I want to go to the next Commonwealth games. It really drives that love for, for those big sporting events. And it's a nice little stadium out there at Rabina as well, too, which is, oh, yeah. uh, you know, sort of one of their little... I mean, it was it was a great... It was really interesting, I remember, when Gold Coast got the Commonwealth Games because the last time we had in Australia, it was in Melbourne, you know, obviously our second biggest city. You've got the MCG, 100,000 people, and kind of it was almost... I think they said it was a bigger event in the city than the 1956 Olympics in terms of competitors and everything along those lines. But wow. then the Gold Coast gets it, and it's sort of... That isn't, I guess, what you would look at the cities of Australia and think that would be a choice for a Commonwealth Games. But it was it was beautifully held. And the, the whole area was just so enamoured by having the Commonwealth Games. And it was such a, a unique atmosphere because you're in this beautiful part of the country too. I mean, you've got the beach literally everywhere you look. I mean, and, and I know having lived in Canada, golden sand isn't something that exactly exists too much in Canada. No, it's all rocks out here. It's all rocks. <laughs> it's very weird beaches. sand. It's like, let's go to the beach. Like, yeah. that's not a beach. It's a bunch of rocks in the water. Like, that. what are you talking exactly. about? So how were those? Yeah, like, was... did you get much chance to kind of go to the beach and soak oh, yeah. up the Gold Coast? Absolutely. We, we uh, head down to Surfer's Paradise and we go – down down the strip there and it's it's beautiful and it's it's nice to see the the entire city bought into the the commonwealth games you know everywhere we go there's some sort of flyer about something or there's 
stuffs on TVs and the bars and the, the it re really bought in the entire city bought in. Um, but it's such a yeah beautiful place. <laughs> you know, we came from, it was held in April. So we just had eight months of winter. Yeah. And then we go there and we're just thrilled that it's not zero degrees out. Yep. <laughs> even though it's, it's not, it's not the best time of the year in Australia. And I'm sure there's some Australians looking at us kind of funny. Cause we think oh, it's like the living heat of in summer. Queensland in winter, like it's, it's hilarious because it will drop below 20 and they'll act like it's cold. Um, so yeah. I mean, looking at the Brisbane Olympics in 2032, they're technically a Winter Olympics. It'll be Australia's first ever Winter Olympics because they're being held in winter. So, um, oh, really? But it's it's Queensland. You know, they're, they're saying is, you know, beautiful one day, perfect the next. That's kind of their slogan. So yeah. It's sort of, oh, it's yeah. There. there was, I can't remember the name of it, but did you go to the, the bar downtown in Surfers? It was like the Team Canada. It was like their little designated bar because i remember yes. going there and like yes, i wanted the poutine i wanted kind of you know nanaimo bars and they had them all during the commonwealth games yeah i i remember going to that bar but we were only there we we went there for just um just like a meet and greet with fans and stuff like that so it was a quick we were in we were out um, we didn't get to really enjoy it that much but i do remember every place we go to there seems to be a bunch of Canadians renting out a bar, getting drunk. I don't know if that's good or bad for our look, but I'm, it's I'm good. here to support it. Yeah, that's good. As an Australian, that's good. That's just a Friday for us, so that's that's great. You know, yeah. that's you know, kind of that 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 that's happening. At, at what point, sort of, you had the Commonwealth Games. You obviously had the Rugby World Cup in in 2019. But was there a point where you're sort of more of a regular on the squad that you kind of assumed that the Olympics would happen i mean when the team qualifies are you then thinking okay i'm part of this this is inevitable or is it still a case of no i can't get complacent i've got to keep my laurels in place so i can work towards it and get a secure spot to make the olympic team yeah you could never really rest on your laurels at all i mean one through 13 that went to the olympics um you know i think there were maybe three guys who you could say have guaranteed spots on the team and then everyone else, you know, you're fighting and scrapping for, for everything you can get. Um, with the whole pandemic, we didn't get that many opportunities to showcase our skills. So we had a war two warm up tournaments in Dubai, and then a local tournament against wasn't even a tournament, just a couple games against the development 15s team. And that was it for selection. Um, so it's very difficult to judge a team based off of, you know, a couple of tournaments compared to a normal year, you would have 10 world series tournaments throughout the year that you can pick guys from. Um, so it, it was, it was a tough situation. Um, but I'm just thankful that it was, it was able to happen and the, the Olympics as a whole were able to happen. And were in terms of that period where the games were initially postponed and kind of everything that unsurety, I mean, in terms of yourself with training and I mean, were you hampered a lot with sort of lockdowns or not being able to access facilities or were you able to kind of make shift some training for yourself at your, at your house or kind of areas where you could maybe go to? Yeah. It, uh... Yeah, that was a, that was a crazy time. <laughs> um, yeah, so we we were locked down right away from March. I think it was it was the week after the Vancouver Sevens tournament. So middle March, we went straight into lockdown, and um, we were thankful enough. We have our own gym set up, so we were able to take some of the weights from our gym in Langford and bring them into our house. Um, and I live with two other guys on the team. So we were able to, you know, get enough gym equipment that we could still work out um, while in lockdown. But it was one of those, we were in limbo. We weren't sure whether the Olympics were going to happen or not, whether they're going to be postponed, whether they're going to be canceled. So it was mentally very trying. And that, we ended up getting an email from uh, the Canadian Olympic Committee um, just saying, hey, everyone, we're we've decided to pull out from uh the olympics and i think it was 
I can't remember if Australia did it before us no, or Canada, after us. Canada was, was first. Australia followed just after Canada. Yeah, the first yeah, country just after to, us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you guys pulled out as well. Um, and then once that announcement happened, uh, and then the Olympics ended up getting postponed. Um, I remember just I was cooking dinner one night and. I was just reading all of the comments on just a Facebook group of, you know, the Olympics have been postponed and all the comments were understandable, but everyone felt really bad for the athletes. And I just remember breaking down in my kitchen because, you know, you never know if, you know, the following year, whether they have to postpone it again or what, what the situation is. So I thought I really lost out on going to an Olympics, but thankfully, you know, shortly after that, we got back into our facility, we got back into training and we were able to start training for uh, the Olympics in 2021. Cause it is that unique aspect, which I always am fascinated hearing from particularly our Canadian guests is that that possibility that the Olympics could have realistically still gone ahead in 2020 had they just gone ahead and all of a sudden Canada have said, no, we're not going Australia obviously at that point had, had, Done yeah. so, I mean, there was that realistic chance that, as you were saying, an Olympics is going to be happening and through no fault of your own, you can't go. Absolutely. And it's, it's even up until, you know, days before we were leaving in, in, to Tokyo in 2021, there's that chance that, well, if something happens, you can, you, you know, you might not be able to go. You know, let's say someone gets COVID or, you know, you never know what's happening behind closed doors with the Olympic committee, whether they're deciding whether to go ahead or not. Um, it, it, it it's, was definitely not a normal year in terms of preparation because you at any point could have just not gone. Yeah. Which is and crazy. Even, even, it is crazy. Even there was, um, you know, even when you got there, everyone was very hyper diligent with, rules and regulations because you know for us we flew in played our games and flew out right away but some people were weeks in advance um before they performed their sport and you know if they got covid a week out from their their sport they they were screwed for for not getting able to to play so there's always that fear that if something happens they they won't be able to play which is really fascinating, actually, you mentioned that because the sevens program at the Olympics is, is very quick. It's played over a couple of days. And the men's tournament was right at the beginning. So, as you were saying, you're literally in and out. So, while at the Commonwealth Games, obviously different circumstances in the world, but you can kind of play your tournament in the lead-up afterwards and soak in going to a, a bar, going to the beach, things like that. Here, it's almost like you're just kind of being ferried in, right, sleep here, throw a ball here get back on the plane, piss off. So can you really even soak in what it is like to be in an Olympics at that point? Or was it just so weird that you couldn't really take that aspect in? Uh, Well, we definitely, I'm going to have to go to the next one to figure it out, to compare (laughs) it. Right. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was so we were originally supposed to show up in Japan two weeks before the tournament so that we can get acclimatized and and get used to the Japan humidity. Um, But because of COVID, we decided that we're going to fly in three days before we play. So we're there three days before we played over, over three days. And then we flew out the day after. So we were only in Japan for a week and I knew going in and my parents kept telling me, you know, go take photos, enjoy the experience, like get as much out of it as you can. And I was able to do that in our, you know, six days that we were there, but it still doesn't compare to, you know, what a normal Olympics will feel like. So I'm definitely going to have to go to the next one to, to figure it out. Perfect excuse, right. To kind of, uh, yeah. to, to do that. Just, just quickly, When you officially knew, I mean, obviously we're just talking a little bit there about how there was still unsurety on that, but when you were announced, you knew you were in that squad and you were going to Tokyo. Does that hit you at that moment that you're an Olympian? Does it, when you line up on that first game and you get your uniform kind of like, at what point does all of a sudden you go, shit, I'm an Olympian? 
Um, well, I was in a bit of a unique situation. So the, the team got announced um, and there were 13 of us, but I was the 13th man. Wow. And in, yeah, in the, uh, at the time when that announcement happened, I was under the, um, I assumed that the 13th man didn't get to play. So I knew I was flying to Japan but I thought that there was no chance I would be able to play unless, you know, God forbid somebody got injured before the tournament. So I originally thought that I wasn't going to be able to play and I wasn't going to be an Olympian. So that was quite difficult for me to take. And that was a pretty, pretty dark time. And, and thankfully, you know, my friends and my family were there to, to support me with that. And then over the next couple of weeks rules started changing that, okay, now if you're 13th man and someone goes down in the tournament, I was able to play. And that gave me, you know, a little bit more positive headspace. And then it turned into, okay, if you're, it's just a squad of 13 and 12 get to get picked for each game. And that, still like gave me more positive, positive mindset, but I still couldn't get on the field. Like, I don't know whether I would get on the field or not. So it wasn't until I got on the field against um, New Zealand where I figured out, uh, or it was Japan, sorry, that I knew that I was an Olympian and all the emotions sort of hit me that night. Um, after that Japan game um, and, you know, things worked out where I was able to play. And then that's when I sort of broke down that, uh, you know, I did something very special. It's unique to, to go through those emotions because as you're saying, I mean, there was every realistic chance that you're just there and, and you, you're you there to play. You know, it's it's all well and good to wearing the uniform and being in an Olympic games. But at the end of the day, if you're not competing, that's not what you're there for. So that that's a pretty incredible story to think that, you, you know, you went through those roller coasters of sort of achieving the dream, but not really. And then all of a sudden getting it sort of all ticked off in that game. Yeah. And the, the worst part of it was even when, you know, I was 13th man, all I, you know, my only hope of getting onto the field was if one of my friends, one of my teammates, gets injured and it takes away from their dream so it was a weird weird mindset to be at where you know i have to keep training keep trying to you know be at the top of my game knowing that i'm only going to get on if somebody else gets injured so it was, it was very um tough to to think of it that way because you know, I never want to see any of my friends get hurt, um, any of my teammates get hurt. Um, but thankfully, everything worked out for, for itself. So that moment then, I mean, just quickly back to the World Cup in 2019, you score a try against Italy. What do you take on board more as a personal achievement? Lining up in Olympic Games, playing in the Olympics? Or, I mean, scoring a try at a World Cup must be a pretty special feeling. I mean, can you kind of compare each of them and take one higher than the other? Um... I don't know. They're both very special to me. Um, you know, the try that I scored against Italy was in that moment, I, I felt on top of the world um, and thought that, you know, I've done it. I've accomplished everything I've wanted to accomplish until I went to the Olympics and got onto the field then. And then I said to myself, all right, you've, you've done it. You've done what you've always wanted to do. So it's, it's kind of, I don't know, it's incremental and, uh, you know, scoring the try against Italy, going to a world cup, playing against South Africa, who ended up winning the world cup, playing against New Zealand, just being there. Um, it was pretty special. Then going to the Olympics in the same country, yeah. in Japan, um, is also just a lifetime achievement. So I'm, 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 I should apply to be Japanese citizenship at this point because I'm all on board. The people of Japan are amazing. They host amazing events. Um, you know, I want to go back to Japan just to visit um, and see all that Japan has to offer. 
which, if I'm not mistaken, the next Rugby World Cup is also in France and then the Olympics in France, right? So it's kind Absolutely. of this weird six degrees of separation where you have a World Absol- Cup in the same yeah. country the year before the Olympics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's going to have to do that as well. That's correct. Because I think Australia, I think, are bidding for is it the 2028 World Cup. But maybe we need to push it back to the... Oh, sorry, the 2027. We should push back to 2031 so that then they're the year before the Brisbane Olympics. So, therefore, that kind of just keeps its trend. So, the US should host the 2027 World Cup. So, we just kind of keep there this we weird go. pattern Cause, going. Because it's... LA is the 2028 yeah. Olympics. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Again, it's, I'll write an email to the people in charge. And you've got we'll better connections that. than I do, Andrew. So I feel like you can <laughs> yeah. kind of take this advice and, and run with it, right? Like we'll it, see. It, it kind of plays. And also on that note, I mean, you mentioned you have South Africa in your group. They go on to win. You have Fiji in your group at the Olympics, and they go on to win. Now, that game was pretty epic for, for Canada up against Fiji. I mean, you were leading, if I'm not mistaken, at one point, were you not? Um, and only lose the game 28 to, to 14 against the reigning champions, the eventual Olympic champions. I mean, how big of a game was that for the for the team? And then that ultimately leads into that Japan game where you play and you, you do enough to make it through the quarterfinals. But that performance against Fiji, I can imagine the, the mood amongst the camp, despite losing, must have been pretty high to take it up to the Fijians that way. Yeah, I mean, we were pretty disappointed with how we played against Great Britain. We came out very flat and and didn't put a good showing in. So we knew that if we wanted a shot at at getting through to the quarters and getting a medal, we were going to have to put two good performances against Fiji and uh, and Japan. Um, Unfortunately for us, we we were able to do that. And then it was a nail-biter for us watching that Kenya and Ireland game just so we had to go through on points differential and we were just scroll. We didn't have the game live. No one could watch it live, but we're just refreshing our Twitter feeds, trying to see what the score is at, what's going on. Uh, Cause we needed, I think it was, we needed Kenya to win or by less than five or less than seven. Wow. Something like that in order for us to get in. And then they ended up winning, winning by five. And we just, once that news came in, it, it, the whole team thought they were on top of the world. Cause we still had a shot at winning a medal. And was that the goal? Was that sort of you all went into Tokyo with medal on the mind? Yep, absolutely. Similar to, uh, you know, the women's team, what they did in, in Rio with getting a bronze medal, we just thought, why not? Why can't we do that? You know, the sevens is one of those sports where anything can happen. You know, the last World Set World Series tournament in Vancouver, we ended up winning bronze and we took down Fiji. We took down South Africa um, and ended up getting bronze medal. So we were right there for the taking. Which is, this is why I love sevens. And I mean, look, I come from a, not really a rugby part of Australia. I'm more in the Australian football part of the country, which doesn't mean I still don't follow rugby. Obviously, I I still love the sport, but I always like watching rugby at the Olympics more because it is that competitive nature where I can see a Canada win a medal. I can see Fiji. I can, I can see these nations. Whereas again, as I said before, realistically, I'm not going to see Canada go on to a rugby world cup final. It's, It's not really going to happen. So it is that, excitement i feel that sevens brings of yeah. that competitive nature so that an olympics is a little bit more open exactly and look at look at the rgs the rgs are you know they're a good team they're you know around eighth in the world normally on on the world series and then they come out and get a bronze medal and put a yeah. performance of their lifetime out there get a bronze medal that that story is unbelievable and that's what sevens is you know you anyone can win on any day but at the Vice versa, anyone can lose on any day as well. Which so, I've got to say, as an Australian, it's pretty exciting to see not only New Zealand lose the gold, but then Britain lose the uh, the bronze. So you know, <laughs> yeah, there you go. We yeah. we can't complain. That the quarterfinal though against New Zealand, again similar to I guess Fiji, you really did take it up to them at, at that point. Um, I mean, obviously you say the goal is to win a medal. I, I can't imagine it's not disappointment. But again, can you reflect on it now that some time has passed, and again think well we took it up to one of the best teams in, in the world and, and very nearly the result could have gone a different way. Absolutely. Like, yeah, I'm so proud of everyone just for the 
eight months previous to the Olympics leading up and then ending up going to the Olympics and taking it to Fiji, taking it to, to New Zealand. Um, uh, yeah, I'm so proud of every one of those guys who put in a lot of years um, to get to that point. Um, so we all need to be damn proud of, of what we did out there. How do you back it up when it, like, this is one of these unique things about sevens and, and some of these sports at the Olympics where you, you get eliminated from medal contention, but you still then let's play for fifth. Uh, I mean, do do you give a shit? Like, I mean, do you go out there and kind of go, oh, I really couldn't give it a, a shit where we finish? Or is it really a case of, okay, well, we're eliminated. We can't win a medal. We're going to do the best we can to finish the highest we can at this tournament. Oh, we definitely care. Because it goes, it, it's not, uh, I mean, yes, it's awesome to, to get a medal, but us performing better at the Olympics also means us getting more funding from the government to give us, you know, better resources. So we were still fighting for, you know, being able to say we were a fifth place team at, at the Olympics, um, you know, instead of being an eighth place team. So we're still fighting for those last couple games because you never know what's going to happen. Um, but those two games we we – kind of thought less about the outcome and more about just enjoying and leaving it all out there for each other. Cause we all knew, you know, that group has been together for the past, you know, seven, eight years. And uh, we knew that a bunch of guys were going to retire and that it would be their last times ever playing for Canada. So uh, it was quite emotional and, and we all wanted to, put in a good showing for each other. Which I don't know if this is the part where as an Australian, I meant to apologize for the fact that I, <laughs> yeah. like, I, I don't yeah. know. Um, do I need to, Andrew? I can if you want no, to. No, that's but... all right. That's all right. You know, <laughs> couldn't have asked for more. <laughs> Which, which, I mean, we, we got revenge. The girls beat the U.S. in for fifth. So I guess kind of you're welcome on that side of things. Yeah, um, thanks, thanks. That, that yeah, will do that, well. Yeah, that, that We're, kind of it's works. even. It's even now. Yeah, as long as, long as the Americans yeah. are. The we, we have, uh, <laughs> yeah, we have Australia in our pool in Dubai in a couple months. So, uh, right. you know, if you, you, you want to talk to them, say, you know, maybe take it easy, make sure that we get, <laughs> uh, we get through to the corners, that'll be good. I, I, I will hook you up. I, 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 okay. I don't know how my connections kind of play on that one, but I'll, I'll, I'll definitely <laughs> see what you what I can do there. So, I mean, moving forward, you've also got, you know, Dubai, World Series and that sort of stuff, but Commonwealth Games in 2022. And then, as you mentioned a few times, sort of Paris, kind of that's just these are sort of the goals that you keep kind of working towards now? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a new group of guys. Um you know, from the team at the Olympics, there's only five returning players um, and everyone else is, is new. Um, so it'll, it'll be good. It'll be definitely a learning curve for a lot of people going from playing club rugby straight into, all right, now we're in Dubai playing for in front of a ton of fans. Um, but this year will be, there's 12 tournaments. There's the 10 World Series tournaments and there's Commonwealth Games. And then I believe there's also the World Cup of Sevens um, down in South Africa next next September, I want to say. Um, so there's a ton of rugby to be played and, and all these young guys are just itching to get out there and, and, and uh, you know, put a good showing for it so that we can, you know, do a bit better than we did at the Olympics in Paris. And with how the scene is now, do you still keep an eye on the 2023 World Cup or is this sort of you, you mainly focus on the sevens? I mean, is it possible to kind of be able to, to focus on both or does it come to a point where you can kind of only really choose one over the other? Well, unfortunately, um, Canada lost to Chile a couple of weeks ago in um, World Cup qualifications. So Canada won't be at the 2023 World Cup in, oh. in France. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's, that, I didn't know that. That's got to be one of the first times in a while. I feel, I feel Canada's always a state. That's the first, the... yeah, this is the first time they've ever not been to a World Cup. Wow. And to Chile. I didn't even realize Chile played rugby. No offense to I our know. Chileans. I know, but, yeah. Wow. Uh, okay. They, yeah, the Chile, Chileans put on a very good showing. Over the past year, they've taken down 
an uh, Argentina A team. They took down a Georgia team, I believe. So they've been really up and coming. And wow. uh, yeah, unfortunately, that means that we lost out on a World Cup spot. Which, I mean, obviously you don't want to miss out in a World Cup. That's obviously very disappointing. But in some weird way, can that then, now that the country can switch purely focus on, say, the 2024 Olympics, do you think in some weird way that can help? Or are the 15s and 7s so separate that that doesn't really affect the 7s program? Um, it shouldn't affect the 7s program too much. Um, you know, I'm pretty biased, but... You know, I think that they should switch focus and try and get people into sevens and try and buy in on the sevens side of the game because, you know, there's still an opportunity for us to go to the Olympics compared to a World Cup. But I know Rugby Canada, from their perspective, they value the 15s game a lot more than they value the sevens game. Um, so we still haven't really seen how it's going to play out um, in terms of you know, looking forward and decision-making over the next five years to see where Rugby Canada is going to put, put their money. But, um, yeah, it, only time will tell what, what they decide. I don't make those decisions. Those are above my pay grade. <laughs> Watch this, but they're not the connections you have yet, right? So that's No, not about, yet. Not yet. They not don't yet, listen yet. to me. I try and try and tell them <laughs> stuff, but they don't listen to me too often. <laughs> Now, Andrew, we'd like to close out with a few kind of random fun get to know you style questions. But before I do, a couple of things I want to just touch on. Now, yep. I think in Australia, when Australians think of Canadian rugby players, we think of a certain Mike Pike, who obviously famously okay. scored a try against the All Blacks uh, in a World Cup and came out to Australia, won a premiership for the Sydney Swans in Australian football, and, you know, the rest is history. Have you ever kind of been swayed by the Mike Pike story to think that maybe you could come out to Australia and give a crack at Australian football? Because we're pretty pretty good success rate in Australia, one from one from Canadian rugby okay. players who okay. scored tries at the World Cup. So just saying, you could come out to Australia I'm and uh, try it. I'm into it. Yeah, for sure. We should definitely do that. I'll... Uh... I'll look at flights today and we'll see wh where, when I can come down there. <laughs> have, you, have you ever seen Australian football before? Uh, not live. I'd love to go live. But we, I remember in high school, we had a couple of Australians come in and teach us for a gym class one time. Mm -hmm. And that was a ton of fun doing speckies off each other's speckies, right? You've got yeah, the terminology speckies. down, Pat. <laughs> yeah, Good job. <laughs> exactly. I'm halfway there. <laughs> you are. You are. Which, I mean, it's actually fascinating because right now, one of, I guess, the, the biggest international players in the league is a guy called Mason Cox. He's American and he plays basically for the biggest club. It'd be like if an Australian went and played for the Toronto Maple Leafs, like, you know, you go straight to the biggest wow, club essentially okay. and play. And he got a lot of press over the last few years. He had a very famous game, put the team into like the championship game a couple of years ago, but he's never won a premiership. He's never won the, the ultimate goal. Whereas Mike Pike mm. did. I mean, I famously remember in 2012, Sydney win the grand final and same colors as a Canadian flag, red and white. So it's perfect draped around his shoulders. So I feel Australians need to get on board more with the fact that I believe he was the first ever international player to win a premiership, a Canadian. So it's yep. a good, it's a good strike rate and bugger Mason and the Americans. We've got to one up them. So, and I'm just saying that yeah. the team well, behind me there, Carlton come play for yeah. us. We need some good players. So. All right. Yeah. I'm in. You, you <laughs> talk to the coach over there, but that just yes. goes to show, you know, another, another Canadian doing something better than an American. Yeah, so, exactly. That's what go. we want it. We want to hear, right? That's all we, <laughs> we, all we want yeah. to keep hearing that. Another thing too, I read that whenever you travel somewhere, you have to go to a Starbucks and take a photo. Now, is this, yes. is this true? And, and how did this World come Tour. about? Okay. So how did this come World about? Tour. Um, you would be shocked at how much coffee guys drink on tour. It, it is, especially on 15s tours, the amount of coffee that some of, especially the big boys drink is <laughs> astounding. And I, I kind of figured, you know, without really thinking about it too much, I've gone to a Starbucks almost everywhere that I go. And then a couple of years ago, I kind of realized like, I always go to a Starbucks. So we, <laughs> uh, Phil, my roommate is actually going around and there's this Starbucks traveler mugs. Yep. Yep. And he's trying to get one of those traveler mugs from everywhere that he goes. He's got a couple places right now. Um, so he's going to collect his Starbucks stars and, and spend those to get a traveler mug. 
<laughs> and, and yours is just a photo, so you don't go out of your way to Mine's get Mine's just a photo. Mine's just, just a photo. A photo. Yeah. So how many have you – do you tick them off? Like have you got a list of how many you've been to now? I don't have a list, but I think, you know, Georgia – I'm not entirely sure whether they have Starbucks in Georgia, but I definitely didn't go to one in Georgia. But almost everywhere else I've been to a Starbucks, I think. So you did the surfers, you did the, the I'm guessing you did the Gold Coast. You, yep, yep, yep. yep. I mean, and do you count um, then like, the lo- in- like there's a few in Victoria. So like, I mean, do you go to Langford? Do you, do you then go out to, you know, like Mayfair <laughs> and kind of just like tick off the local ones while you're there? <laughs> uh, yeah, we can. I do. I, I'm a regular at um, the spot, Baron Joey, actually owned by an Australian guy here in Victoria. Ah, right. So uh, I'm a regular there. So I, I don't want to cheat on him. Um, okay fair enough go to a starbucks but uh yeah i'm a big coffee guy so i'm gonna make a list i'm gonna make a What's, list and and I, I went, we were down seen. in we were down in seattle playing the u.s um, two two and a th- two and a half years ago and the one thing i wanted to do was i had to go to the original, place, starbucks, the original starbucks one yep the original yep. one and then we ended up doing it and i took more than enough photos for for a lifetime. Down Did you have there. to line up? There's always a line around the block, isn't there, to kind of get in there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like a yeah, it was like a reserve one. Yeah, it was it was. I, so I, I remember it, they and they they come up to you, don't they? Because they're like, "Are you here for coffee or merchandise?" Like I swear they like ask you, and I remember going, "Can I not have?" both like <laughs> or do i have to choose do i have to like buy a coffee yeah. then reline up to buy a mug um, yeah is- i remember going in there and i wanted i kind of wanted like a special one like a original yep. like so i asked them hey do you have any special ones or is this the regular starbucks menu and they said no it's the original starbucks menu i was like oh, okay that's not that special <laughs> <laughs> it's not that great it's funny actually yeah. when you the U.S. is interesting when it comes to these first. I remember being in Salt Lake City and the world's first KFC is in Salt Lake. It's not even in freaking Kentucky. Kentucky? You would think. You would think. But the you first think, ever KFC yeah. is actually in Salt Lake City. Um, yeah. So it's weird that you kind of tick those things off. I, it's funny you mentioned coffee. I never thought I would miss coffee in North America. I used to travel to North America and go, shit coffee like seriously americans and canadians do not know how to make coffee but yeah i got so used to drinking my iced coffees with cream that you just cannot find it in australia like i go to mcdonald's on the summer drink days in canada and just get my dollar you know large coffee oh, yeah. boom iced coffee cream perfect here they stare at you like cream do you mean milk I'm like no 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 cream cream oh cream. no we don't do that they look at you like you're you're speaking another language so i miss that about canada We'll send you. I'll send you a couple of bottles of cream. Please do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm sure it will last the journey, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like, absolutely. Kind of there. Do you, do you st- I feel you need to start like a, a separate Instagram or something for your Starbucks photos. Like you could I was do doing like- that for a little bit. I was doing uh, a Co's Coffee Corner, is what <laughs> it was called, and uh, I was taking of taking photos, not necessarily Starbucks, but coffee places around the world that I've been to right. and then I've slowly kind of merged it with my my actual Instagram page so now I just post all that on my actual Instagram page but we haven't traveled in a bit so I haven't been able to to show off my my coffee experiences I feel like I just need to ask the standard question how do you take your coffee like what what's your go-to order right now I'm big on oat milk lattes oh okay yeah yeah. Right. Um, I normally, I normally get like, uh, Americano Misto. Mm-hmm. So just Americano with a, a bit of steamed milk on top. Yep. Um, but I'm not too picky, you know, I'll take it however they want to give it to me. Well, I just, I want to pass on another note just for, for Canadians, Americans, any part of the world that make the flat white incorrectly, uh, okay. flat white has no foam. That's why it's called a flat white so stop putting foam on flat white starbucks it's not a thing <laughs> okay <laughs> you heard it here first <laughs> it was it was actually hilarious i remember when it made the news in australia when starbucks started doing the flat white where we literally sent australian journalists to like new york to get it because it's very australian drink the flat white yeah. And basically the first story was like, this isn't a flat white, there's foam on it. Like you're doing it wrong, America. Oh, no. <laughs> so, yeah, Ugh. just 
Just got to point it out there. Uh, Andrew, as I said, we wrap up each interview with a series of fun, get to know you style questions. Now, as always, we use these from a questionnaire that Team Canada gave their athletes ahead of the Rio and Pyeongchang Olympics. I, as we're aware, oh, they didn't okay. do this for you guys ahead of Tokyo. Now, I'm using this off a, uh, a fellow rugby player. Uh, I've got okay. Bianca Farella. Are you familiar with Bianca at yep. all? So, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm Bianca, Great. yeah. There you go. So uh, I can tell you what she's answered if you if you want to know as well. Yeah, but, we can uh, compare. <laughs> exactly. And as always, there is a, if you want to, homework. There's a drawing element. If you really want to draw shit, you can. We can put it on our social media. If not, it's fine. The first one here is literally draw a picture of yourself. And Bianca's like drawn a, a circle with some squiggly lines, which I'm thinking is meant to be a head with a smiley face on it. So I can almost guarantee she would draw better than I can. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. now I'm kind of intrigued to see just exactly what you draw. Um, <laughs> first question, if you could choose any Olympic host city, where would it be? Oh, it's got to go back to Toronto. I'm from Toronto and uh, they have never hosted an Olympics and I think it would be an amazing spot for a, a summer Olympics. Came very close in 2008, so it's sort of... Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, one of those, those ones. Just on that, there's usually, and I don't know if this will be on this list, but um, there's usually a question of growing up, who was your favorite sports team? So are, are you a Leafs guy? Is, does that what I can Absolutely. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm unfortunately a Leafs guy. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I go through the same struggles every year. I think they're going to go to win a cup, but uh, they always lose in the first round. So I'm on board for for being a Leafs fan this year and we're probably going to lose, but I'm ready to be hurt again. My, my, my co-host Colin is a massive Leafs fan. So I like to give him shit. I'm a, I'm, I'm a co-flamed ducks fan, but uh, okay. so kind of, go there. but if you, if you look behind me, I do have the one, where am I pointing the Raptors? So, you know, I do at least. Oh rep, yeah. There you go. You know, somewhat Toronto. So kind nice. of uh, go that way. Um, in your spare time, what do you most like to do? Um, big netflix person i, I love watching uh, almost any show netflix crave hbo if anyone has any show recommendations you have any show recommendations i'm, I'm here i'm all ears are you, are you um, purely also, just like fiction or do you like documentaries as well like kind of do you i like it i like it all i love trashy reality tv <laughs> i love <laughs> dark dramas i love murder mystery i love everything great well i mean i'm a massive formula one fan if you've never checked out f1 drive to survive oh uh, that yeah i think they should do one of those for the seven series yeah i think that absolutely. would do very well 100 yeah. percent. i mean that's the great thing about netflix with i mean there's so many different sporting documentaries now that they can do and it's sort of for sure i, I agree i think that would be fantastic and and i mean yeah. we're seeing F1 is growing in North America because of Drive to Survive. So why not do this for a sport like rugby, which has already got probably more of an impact on exactly. the continent and grow I'll, I'll like, add it to the list of uh, people I yep. need to email. Please, you're going to be very busy after this interview, I feel I, like. Yeah, I am. I am. A lot yeah. of <laughs> A lot, lot of, of emails homework. to send. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think you were expecting this from, uh, from doing this chat, basically. No, um, no. The weirdest instruction a coach ever gave you was? Oh, man. Um... Try not to sewer any of my coaches here. <laughs> <laughs> well, they know you go to I, Costco, so I mean, kind of, you know, you've you've started. Yeah, I remember we were in. Uh, where were we? We were Romania, I think, on like an under under seventeen, under nineteen tour, or something like that. And the food that we were getting wasn't the best food. You know, lots of guys were going hungry. We were getting very basic stuff. Um, and then our strength and conditioning coach said, go out, eat some McDonald's, just get as much calories into you as you can. And that is the only time I've ever heard any strength and conditioning coach say, go out and get fast food. <laughs> wow. I'm going to hold it. I'm going to hold that to um Anytime I eat fast food, I can say, well, that's my one strength and conditioning coach said that. Yeah, bloody hell. Either that or just always want to play in Romania. I'm like, fuck, I can yeah, eat exactly. all I want. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Should go play over there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Go over there and play in the leagues and stuff like that. McDonald's all the time. Coach says it's okay. That, kind of, uh, <laughs> that works. Uh, what is your favorite workout? Workout? I love doing those spin classes. 
Ah, you know yes. the, the ride spin classes because there's just music blasting it's very dark in there no you can't really see anyone so it's only you who you're kind of racing against and it's very like it's very dancey in there it's like a club but you're on a bike yeah, yeah. yeah. well more of them should exist right bikes and clubs like that's exactly a Add it to the list. Homework. Do some research. Add it to the list. There we you go. Know? It's a long list. <laughs> make make the Langford nightlife a thing, right? You know? <laughs> like exactly. Kind of going yeah. out that way and going to bike nightclubs. That that kind of uh <laughs> that works. If you could have lunch with any one person, who would it be? Lunch with any one person. Well, it's got to be the most famous person right now, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. One, oh, yeah. because I want to see how much he eats, yeah. <laughs> because I'm sure that guy could take down a lot of food. Yep. And two, I want to talk to him about all the bad movies that he's made. Yeah, <laughs> that's a long like, conversation. How is he pick- yeah, how is he picking <laughs> these movies? He just, it's a numbers game. He just sprays out movies and hopes one of them hits. Yeah, that's, it's kind of worse that way. And, like, I guess with his heritage, uh, get him into rugby. I know he played American football, but, like, I mean, oh, yeah. he's got Samoan oh, yeah. heritage. So, I mean, I'm sure there's got to be some rugby somewhere in his family. I'm sure there is. We, we, I remember in Vancouver a couple of years ago, um, we usually have, like, a famous guest show up. And Jason Momoa was oh, our famous guest. Nice. And he had his like all blacks jersey on. He was so pumped just to be there and watch rugby. It looked like he had the time of his life. Um, wow. So I'm sure Dwayne The Rock Johnson, if you're listening, we'd love to have you Vancouver Sevens in March. We love you to be there. We, we, we actually always, funnily enough, you mentioned Jason Momoa. We always give a shout out to Jason Momoa on the show. We had a guest who just randomly midway through an answer was just like, hey, special shout out to Jason Momoa. So as always, hello, Jason Momoa, if you, you listen. We'll add The Rock to that list. Um, yeah, The Rock and Jason Momoa. Just big That's time funny business. that I brought him up without you yeah. telling me that. Exactly. Well, look, I don't want to give ever, all our secrets away, Andrew. Like, yeah. come on, like, you know, I've got to keep some things mysterious. What is and just for- also, uh, Bianca answered Channing Tatum. So uh, okay. the next the next question, well, the next sort of thing here is draw a picture of a Canadian animal. And she's, again, drawn a very, I'm guessing that's a moose. I, I'm hoping it's okay. a moose. Uh, okay. Maybe we can clarify that. Uh, your favorite sandwich <laughs> is? Oh, my goodness. Um, we used to go, there was a tournament down in Vina del Mar in Chile. And we would stay at this hotel and they had the best club sandwiches I have ever had in my life. Nice. Unbelievable club sandwich. Um, so that has to be top of the list. Anytime I'm down there for whatever reason I'm down in Chile, I have to go and get a club sandwich from there. And that's that's why they ended up knocking you guys out of the Rugby World Cup? Good sandwiches. Yep. 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 More, <laughs> more club sandwiches and in 15s will lead to better results. There's your, again, put it on the list. It put it up to the highest. Put it on the list. <laughs> keep, keep coming up there. We're solving, we're going to solve world hunger by the end Jeez. of this. I know the UN should be listening to this. I feel they like should, this is, really should. this is going well. Um, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Oof. Um, I would like to teleport. Mm-hmm. That'd be cool. Cause then I can just teleport down to Chile and get that club sandwich. Come exactly. right back. And be home yeah. for, for home for lunch to eat it exactly. At home. Um, Bianca <laughs> yeah. also answered teleportation, so it's it's, oh, a, it's nice. a rugby mindset. Uh, the best be. candy in the world is best candy would be well, it's you know get around Halloween. So the Pillsbury sugar cookies ah, yeah. are uh, probably top of my list right now. But also there's this Canadian brand called OMGs, mm-hmm. and they're like a toffee chocolate score graham cracker little crumble thing and they're very good and i always regret asking these questions because it just makes me hungry uh so <laughs> it's like why why do i uh answer these? now we already asked this one the favorite sports team i'll say the bianca says the montreal canadian so uh hello okay. rivalry. just just on that though just on the rugby side of things do you follow i mean outside of the international things like do you pay attention to say super rugby sort of in the Southern hemisphere or kind of anything along those lines and go for teams in any of those competitions? Um, well, I try and follow all the Canadian guys. So if there's a Canadian guy playing somewhere, um, I'll follow them. So in super rugby, our John was with the chiefs for a while. So, ah, okay. you know, I tried to follow the chiefs for a little bit. Um, you know, there's, 
two Canadians, Arjun now plays for Cast in France. So does a buddy of mine, Matt Tierney. So I try and follow them a little bit. Um, but for the most part, it's it's mostly where Canadians go to play. I've got a, a good friend co-host on one of my other shows. He's a, he lives in Waikato, so he's a, he's a Chiefs man. But, I, I mean, I lived in mm. Invercargill, so kind of we were Highlanders territory. So it's, it's weird okay. as an Australian that I go for a New Zealand team. But, I mean, coming from the part yeah, of Australia that, that, I go, that I'm from, we don't really have a team that I can go for. So I'm like, well, I lived in an area, Highlanders could go to the game. So there you go. Yeah. Why not jump on board with it? Do you actually, I mean, do you ever pay attention to like rugby league? Is that a thing that you even acknowledge? Like, do you look at something like the NRL or what they sort of have the super league in the, in the UK or is it just completely foreign? Uh, not really. Like I see all the highlights on, on my Instagram. I see like what's going on, but in terms of following it, I couldn't tell you who's won the last couple um, yeah, not, not particularly now. Get on board the Sharks just in the, in the NRL. Okay. You, I'm a big to, Sharks just, fan now. Yeah, Up go, the sharks. go Sharks. Up the Sharks. Uh, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? Oof. Um, that is a tough question. I would like to say... Oh, man, I don't know. <laughs> Italy seems nice. I've never been to Italy in my life, but okay. it seems like a beautiful place with lots of culture, very good food. Good coffee. Relax. Good coffee. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go with that. Sure. Sure. Bianca says New Zealand. I, I don't know if I should be impressed or offended. Um, yeah. But, <laughs> you, you know, uh, I always like this question because it can go any different direction. When I was Uh-oh. little, what was one thing I always thought? Something I always thought. Mm. Oh, geez. I was a pretty wild child. <laughs> I'm looking for some wild answers now. That, that <laughs> excites me even more. <laughs> oh, I, don't, I don't know. I, I feel like when I was younger, there wasn't a lot of thinking being done. It was more active. <laughs> well, there's the answer. I didn't uh, think. I just did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I would, ran, I would run my head into things. <laughs> Which probably explains a lot. That's why you were getting wearing... yellow and red cards and going to exactly. run. You just wanted to hit people and run into things. Yes. <laughs> I'd run my head into all. I used to just run my head into my mom all the time and she would <laughs> hate it. Rightfully so, but I would just always do that. Wow. They might do a, a head scan of you at one point and look at this. Oh, you concussion, not from your rugby days. It's from head button my mum all the time. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, where did that come from, basically? That's where, yeah, that's where the whole <laughs> rugby started. Uh, now, the final one here, again, this is, this is one that you've already got or you don't. Like, I, I feel this is kind of one way or the other. What is your favorite joke to tell? <laughs> uh, the one I usually go to, my go-to is... Um, there's a uh, there's a German ship off the German coast, and okay. uh, he ends up hitting a rock, and he starts going down. And the captain of the ship grabs the grabs the mic and just goes, "Help! Help! I'm sinking! I'm sinking!" And then the the coast guard German coast guard grabs uh, the mic and messages back, "What? What are you singing about?" <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it. <laughs> I'm going to clap that. That's pretty good. Um, I like that one. That's, that's very yeah, good. That's um, the only one I got. So. Oh, use it. That works. Um, Bianca's is, what's orange and sounds like a parrot? What's orange and sounds like a parrot? I have no idea. A carrot. <laughs> I mean... That's a good one. That's yep. a good one. Dad wow. jokes always hit. Jesus. Rugby players are great comedians i feel yeah. that uh we we need to to go on that andrew before let's go you mentioned before about instagram uh tag instagram social media anything you want to plug where people can sort of uh follow your journey towards paris and beyond absolutely and uh, andrew co with two e's that's andrew c-o-e-e on instagram and twitter um i'm not well versed enough in social media to have tiktok so i'm sorry all the tiktok fans <laughs> It's just Instagram and Twitter. <laughs> one day, one day. Again, as I always one say, my dad joke for that is I thought TikTok was a Kesha song. So, um, 
Yeah, but that's a good one too. <laughs> that's all I know it from. Uh, Andrew, seriously, it's been a lot of fun learning about your career, the sport in Canada, everything else in between. I'm sorry I've given you so much homework, but uh, at least uh, right. we can get some Starbucks love out there and, uh, yeah, uh, teach them more about flat rights Starbucks and how to make them. <laughs> Yeah, hell yeah. I would never say no to, you know, Mr. Schultz and giving us a couple of million bucks. That would be handy right about now, right? Absolutely.